smo na Radio Študen pred zašter partije Laure Paris kot Trabl, ki bo izgajalo oziroma proizvajalo vizuali, ki jih lahko že vidite na nas oziroma za našimi hrbti in z Simon Hilmerjem oziroma Diamond Terrifierjem. Oba dva sta oziroma trenutno prebivata v New Yorku. Sam je znan kot eden izmed treh članov zasedbe ZIS. Oba dva skupaj pa delujete tudi pod imenom Trabl kot performativno glasbeni dvojec. So, Sam and Paris, welcome to Radio Student. Thank you. This is a bit of a backwards thing because you've already did the concerts and this is, it's going to be pre-recorded. Uh, but in the past, in the near past, yesterday, uh, on Thursday in Pritlice, you were performing in uh, in the city center with uh, Bursa and by yourself. Uh, how was it? How is it like meeting local scenes, I guess, not for the first time for you? Oh, not, no, not for either of us. Yeah, no, we've been to Ljubljana, I think, like, eight times, actually. Oh, and wow. we I've love... been eight times. How many times have you been? Uh, maybe twice, maybe. But I, I love it here. I, I'm always impressed by how friendly and smart and, like, digitally aware and forward-thinking and fluent in English everybody is here. <laughs> it's very impressive. Oh, yeah, well, that's good to hear. I've also heard through the grapevine that you might be having uh, a cooperation with uh, the person, uh -huh. the, the group that also performed in Pritice, so looking forward to that. But I wanted to ask you about your really uh, connected to, uh, let's say, community or organizing, uh, activism, um, just nurturing that not only self of alone and like a lonesome author, but doing work in communities. And it, on your Twitter, I... Uh, ah! <laughs> yes. Can't believe anybody reads this. Okay, oh dear. Twitter, the, Twitter the treasure trove. But I saw like an interesting hashtag in your bio and it's social noise. Uh-huh, yes. And of course, um, if, if I would be like a really PR person, uh, all of the music or all of your work could be described, but also yours, Laura, as, you know, noisy uh, to people that are maybe not necessarily in that specific jazz avant-garde uh, art scene. Uh -huh. But what do you mean by social noise? Uh, um, okay, so, so social noise is... Um, a, this is a kind of a complicated uh, thing to talk about, but um, social noise is a construction that I came up for myself to describe um, an aspect of the process that I bring into all of the projects that I'm a part of, wherein um, aesthetically what I'm doing most of the time in some way or another is challenging to a viewer or a listener. So there's some threshold, you know, there's something about the work that is pushing people's capacities for taking in, you know, whether it's auditory or visual or what have you. Um, I mean, I do think that the work that I make is ultimately engaging, but it does deal with uh, kind of pushing people's listening or viewing abilities to a kind of limit or 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 if it's a performance it could be a performance wherein the endurance that's required is kind of extreme but so that would be like the noise element right where it's just something disruptive right like fundamentally like noise just refers to something disruptive but then the idea of social noise is that somehow the production of this of these aesthetic artifacts is connected to a social process that itself is also disruptive, okay? So here's what I mean. Um, I would say that um, like computer noise music generated in an academic context, for example, right? Mm -hmm. People are studying composition at a university and they have access to the electronic music studio and they go in and they make something 
that is very noisy and kind of difficult to listen to, okay? So this is noisy, but it is not socially noisy because they're operating in a context that is set up to support them doing this exact thing, and this is kind of what people expect them to do, and then they go do it. And then while the product might be noisy and difficult to listen to, there's nothing disruptive about what's happening socially through this process, okay? So what I think, what I'm interested in is when the something about the orchestration of the project itself is disruptive even at the process level so that the people and or institutions and listeners and viewers and presenters and so on involved are, are pushed in some way not just in terms of their ability to digest an aesthetic product that will ultimately be presented to them, but also by the process they must engage to get to the point wherein the aesthetic product is either produced or consumed. Okay, so then this could be like, for example, we build um, mazes. Yes, that's what I wanted to follow up on. Right, so that, I, I promise I'm almost done. So that, so that would be an example of something that's kind of socially noisy because everybody involved is like having to deal with this structure being put in their space. And then if we're producing a performance program inside of the maze, then the people who are presenting the concerts, they have to kind of explain to everybody, well, well it's in a maze, so you're not gonna be able to stand there or you might not be able to see this person. And then the performers have to contend with being in the maze and like everything about the social fabric of the situation is kind of like, oh, kind of like, making people stretch a little bit. So that would be like, that's what I'm referring to when I talk about social noise. Yeah, with the, Long, complicated answer, sorry. <laughs> yeah, but uh, with the Maze Project, what was the name of the festival that was then involved? You were here. Uh, no, no, I didn't. Uh, I wasn't at the festival. But no, 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 that's what it's called. Oh, you are here. Okay. You are here, so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's confusing. <laughs> but um, do you think, I mean, you did that in 2007? For the first time, the first but we've time? done it six times. So, so 2007, 2009, Nine, twice 2000, in 2012, right, and 2014, once in 2014, and once in 2016, and now soon it will happen again. All right, so it has quite a long of a lifespan for a project that seems like a very, uh, at, at least uh, seemed at the start like an ad hoc thing, uh, but. With the mazes, um, do you think that, uh, or the We Are Here project, musically and how people interact with music and performance and art and how people interact with it, um, have you seen a shift in people's, like, did people get more comfortable? Is this like stepping over your boundaries um, more mm. common now? You know, like the whole democratization of music, of knowledge connected to it, or is it just becoming more and more absorbed into itself? Interesting question, because you're right, 2006, about 2007, yeah, like a lot of time has passed. I think what, like what I notice most is um, an increase in how people want to document these moments, just like Instagram, like if mm -hmm. something's Instagram friendly, if, you know, like when we first started doing it, it was before everyone had a smartphone and everybody was constantly taking video. And so I think people were more in the experience. And then like the last one that we did, like just, you know, people were just super in, I mean, from 2009 forward, people were just really into taking video while they were experiencing it. And, um, so, I mean, that's more on like the spectator level. And so I, but I think that mediates people's experience. So like they almost want a disruptive experience so that they can document it. And I think that there, yeah, there's kind of this commodification of disruption, um, which is, I don't know, I don't know what to do with that. Is it like disappointing? Is it good? Is it like this thing that was disruptive has become more absorbed, like you're saying, into like mainstream society. So then it becomes more diffuse, but then it, do you know what I'm saying? No, I know what you're like, saying. It becomes more diffuse, but also more spread out. Well, there's a lot of emphasis placed on things being immersive or experiential. Yes. Like um, <clears throat> as a musician, 
I think there's a lot of kind of onus on you to produce something that is not just a musical performance, but that is also like, can be kind of marketed as like an experience. So many musicians will have, you know, a relatively complicated lighting writer and carry a projectionist. And then often there's some dimension of props involved and, you know, like smoke and you know, everything has yes. to be this kind of like theatrical, immersive presentation. I think because um, documentation has kind of, has sped up so much that in the past to you'd see a musical performance and then you'd buy the record and listen to the musical performance and this somehow felt kind of miraculous right but now everybody is constantly documenting everything so to to see documentation of something that's just that somehow the real life thing has to differentiate itself from the documentation do you follow what I mean? Yes. Because we are constantly consuming documentation of, of real life. So in order for an experience to compete at all as something that people might come to, it has to somehow surpass the documentation that they're always consuming. Otherwise, why would they go? Do you know? So there is, I would agree with Laura, this kind of um, increased emphasis on disruptive experiences and immersive experiential stuff. Um, and a kind of commodification thereof. So yeah, I, I'd say that audiences now are more kind of open and uh, open to it and excited about it. But it's still extremely frustrating for everybody else involved. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, it's still frustrating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think the maze in particular, like, um, you know how like in traditional, if you could say that, performance art, like so much of the work is about the experience of the performer. Mm -hmm. You know, like if somebody were going to like swallow a string and pull it out to the other side, like, you know, and it went over like, I don't know, 10 hours. The spectator isn't probably going to be watching for 10 hours. So it's really the performer. And I, I think the maze is also very much about disrupting the experience of the performer like because you know you can't stand on stage if you're a group you may have like one person there one person there like so i think that that is still yes it's still frustrating but i also think like we it's interesting you ask this question because we're thinking through like what will the next iteration of this maze be and we really need to figure out how to disrupt the documentation piece because that's how everything is mediated right now so yes the easy answer would be no phones or sticker on the cameras yes. but it does not this it just solves the end uh, product not the problem itself but because this is a really quick interview mm -hmm. one last question <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay yeah, yeah we can do this all day yes. mm. it, it would be also lovely to do this all day mm. uh, but a few years ago it um I was reading uh, about your performance in 2014 with Berger and I, I can't remember the other trio, but the author pointed out this interesting... Wait, which, where was this? Um, at one of the Sonic events, but in Ljubljana. Ah. So it was just like, uh, it was interesting. The author pointed out that this, um, you being a visiting outside foreign artist, uh, like clashing or the possibility of not or cooperating with the local mm -hmm. scene, the local uh, music. Mm -hmm. And you in one interview saying that, um, yeah, it used to be that the whole point of festivals or performances that you would get to fly someone from the outside, definitely not give a local chance mm -hmm. or just make the, uh, the local artist as standard. Mm -hmm. And how do you like see yourself now in this position, coming to Ljubljana, participating uh, or cooperating, working with Persa in this specific <laughs> example? Um, okay, I want that that covers a lot of ground. So I, 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 I <laughs> want to I, I want to just summarize. Um, I'm not familiar with the write up that you spoke about, but I do remember the concert that you're talking about. Um, my experience performing in Ljubljana um, has always been very, um, it's never felt uncomfortable between myself and the other people who are 
um, performing. You know, there are situations where I get in and either I'm going to play or Aziz is going to play. And it feels like we're kind of in the wrong place. You know what I mean? Like we play and it just feels a little bit like awkward or like what we're doing isn't really working with what everybody else there who is maybe local is doing. But I've always felt in Ljubljana that there's a um, great degree of um, kind of similarity and shared interest between the groups that we've always been programmed with. So this I've never experienced as an obstacle. I think in the interview you're talking about where I'm talking about festival culture and how festival culture f tends to focus on bringing people in to a place from the outside. I was talking about the maze and about how the You Are Here festival that's programmed within the maze instead of focusing on bringing artists from out of wherever we're mm -hmm. presenting it ordinarily in New York, but we've also presented outside of New York, that the festival focuses on causing the local community to all share the experience of presenting work within the maze. So it's an inversion of the ordinary presenting dynamics that one finds in a festival context. So, I mean, to just say a little bit about that briefly, I do think, <clears throat> I do think that there's something questionable about the, the extent to which festivals come to places and bring an enormous amount of resources and money and attention to presumably to this place, but in my experience going around playing festivals, oftentimes local communities in the places where these festivals happen feel a bit on the outside of the festival. Do you understand what I mean? Like, it's not like, oh, this is this great thing for the scene. It's kind of like, this is this thing that just happens here. And maybe, like, the businesses and the hotels make a lot of money because a lot of people come. And, okay, great. But, like, as a local arts community, this doesn't really do much for us. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I do think that there's, that there's, like, a ratio issue, I think, with, with many festivals where festivals could, and in my opinion, should focus more on what they're bringing to the local community, the local communities of creative practice that inhabit the places that the festivals um, are at, right? Um, they could do more in this case. Um, so then, to the final piece of your question, uh, how do I feel? I mean, in, in this case, I'm not performing at a festival, I'm just being hosted by a local presenter, and, and this, I think, uh, is not something that I would seek to problematize ever in any setting. I think musicians traveling around from place to place um, working with local venues and whatnot to present music is 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 great for everybody to do this as much as possible. Um, <clears throat> and I love it. And I feel great about it. But I do think when I am playing festivals, like some bigger festivals, like in Poland, I've played Off Festival and Donau Festival and Austria and Unsound and Primavera and all of these things, you know, I, I do think there's something kind of weird about those things. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's like, you get on stage and it's like, Deutsche Bank, Gatorade, Ray-Ban, da, da It's like all this stuff and somehow this has something to do with the festival and you're like up there playing for like, you know, a thousand people, but it's not really clear if they're there to see you or they're just kind of at this thing that they heard about. And somehow there's all of this corporate interest and then like, it becomes like an advertising moment for them somehow. And like, I don't think anybody's really kind of clear on the specifics of that. But as a musician, you need to make a living, and this is kind of often a good paycheck, so you can't really argue with it. But there is something that feels a little bit murky about what's really going on at those things. <laughs> you know? In this case, like we're so lucky because we're going to be able to collaborate with Persa and really have that connection with you know people here who are doing kind of similar work in many ways and like their video work is really amazing right so you know we have a lot of good ideas like um well we were talking yesterday about we're gonna have a whole week together in april and um you know we're thinking about how we can you know both visually and audio wise um you know kind of have each of the artists um work kind of you know, put it in different frames so you see it, you know, as itself, but also the collaboration, the overlap, and how we can, like, invert the ratios at different points. I mean, these are just some loose ideas, but, I mean, I think this is ideal, ideal for artists, right, to have that kind of, that exchange and um, have the time to really go deep. Right. So we're really lucky. There. Yeah. And, and in the case of the Persa thing, 
that's like a Slovenian organization and Kran facilitating a collaboration between us coming from yes. the outside in Persa. And that feels very like even footed. And it's like, I think that Persa is getting something out of this and like we're getting something out of it. And it, it feels very, very good. This all feels like good. And I'm really happy to be here kind of collaborating and working more with a community that has, that I've come in and out of many times, but never really engaged with in this way. So this, I'm, we're really excited about it. And I think, isn't the project, I don't know the word in Slovenian, the kind of bicycle that has two seats? Tandem? A tandem, is that what they're yes. called? Tandem, tandem. <laughs> well, I hope you get on well then in April. And it was Thank a really you. nice one seeing you here. Hope we had, uh, we'll definitely enjoy the concert on Tuesday. And uh, thanks, Sam um, Monterre for it. Thanks, Laura Trouble. Thank you. Uh, that's it for now. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>
Mm-hmm. <laughs> 